In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Eternal Father, you called St. Philip the Evangelist to open his mouth and begin with Scripture, tell the good news of Jesus Christ. By virtue of our baptism, we too are called to work for the salvation of souls. Instill in our hearts the zeal of St. Philip, that we may convert hearts and minds to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the St. Philip Institute podcast, where we talk about how to teach the Catholic faith to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers, and really anybody you encounter. We want to empower you to have the knowledge of the truth and the love of God so that you may bring others to Him. Your hosts today are Doug, Barry, and myself, Father Justin Braun, and today we're going to be talking about the Sacred Liturgy, a topic that is always near and dear to the heart of Doug and I, and particularly looking at the season of Lent, really, as it, it, it be, begins to unfold on us uh, with Ash Wednesday, um, seeking to kind of look at where the Church's liturgy itself, as mother and teacher, is instructing us, uh, what themes are present there, how the physical and uh, and spiritual kind of come together as, as they do, as we are, you know, body and soul, that within the context of the sacred liturgy she herself the the church is trying to lead us you know to the joy of the resurrection um and we really want to just kind of broaden that to to an understanding of how to live our discipleship through a deeper love of the sacred liturgy um and it's it's really always fun to kind of go around the the churches and the diocese and and i've never been there during that time but during uh lent in rome there's the stational churches church visitations and you get to see a little bit of the local flavor of how each parish uh, looks at the the instructions that are given by the church as general norms and then how they're applied. And so it'll be fun to, to hear from Doug. Maybe you can tell us some of your fun Nebraska stories about <laughs> what church looked like for you as a kid going to Lent. My Nebraska sweatshirt on today. Yes, proudly representing the Huskers <laughs> today. And uh and I'll talk a little bit about yeah my life here in East Texas and then kind of the experiences outside of uh, the, the Piney Woods. But really, we, we're looking to offer um, you know, to all of our listeners uh, an opportunity to maybe be more attentive even just to the liturgy itself throughout the season of Lent. Maybe you can't go to daily Mass all the time, which we'll talk about that too, but um, how the readings themselves instruct us and, and really just kind of better appreciating okay, the church makes a pretty big deal about Lent, right? Mm. And the past three prod- podcasts here on our, our channel have been about Lent, and um, we want to continue to just invite everybody yeah. into having a deeper appreciation of what the church is trying to guide us towards in all this. So um, I, before we jump into our, our kind of first big, t- broad topic, I, I did want to ask you, Doug, are you ready? I mean, it's Tuesday. It's Fat Tuesday. <laughs> are you ready? Tomorrow it all begins. Yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. yeah. I, I do. I, I mean, I love this time. I, I do. Um, you know, <clears throat> growing up as a kid, you, you have the, you know, what are you going to give up for Lent? You know, sort of questions to get out there. And I'm going to give up chocolate. You know, I'm going to give up uh, chewing gum, ice cream, things mm-hmm. like that. And, you know, hopefully we go deeper than that as we get older and we start to really open up and explore a little more, unfold, peel the onion back, you know, all those little metaphors that talk about really getting into what it really is about. Right. You know, the church has, you know, you kind of have these two main, you know, sections of, of the year. You have Advent and you have Lent, and they're two major sections of preparation right. for something amazing. And they're very connected. Right. Ultimately, because the birth of Jesus was for the purpose of him laying his life down on the cross and rising from the grave. So you have this deep connection between Advent and Lent in that respect. And and so I, I love Lent because it's a time where you get to kind of gear up, you get to roll up your sleeves, you kind of... Get ready for that fight, you know, uh, because it is a spiritual battle. And and really what struck me, I'm going to jump ahead in the show here too much, Father, okay. but what really struck me was the year, the day, the moment, and I don't remember when it was. It was years ago, though, that I, I really paid attention to the fact that before Jesus began his public ministry, he went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights mm-hmm. and fasted and prayed. And it was so intense and so powerful that the devil himself comes to our Lord to tempt him. 
Mm-hmm. And he throws scripture at him. He throws the word of God at him as a as a way to try to twist, you know. Right. And uh, and our Lord responds with scripture, you know, an authority and it's powerful. But that whole mindset that that kind of sunk into me of our Lord did this for forty days and forty nights, and he was preparing for the public ministry aspect, the battle, where he would which would culminate in him giving his life and then rising from the grave and really sealing the deal of our salvation if we would be wise enough to accept that that gift. Mm. But that was really a major part for me. So you asked me, am I ready? I am more so than I ever have been in my in my previous years because I see it for that now and as that, as this moment of preparing for a serious spiritual battle. Yeah, man, and I, I, I'm with you. I think the years of advancing through uh, my own discipleship and, and through seminary and priesthood, um, I was just visiting with one of my brother priests this morning and kind of like, I said, hey, are you ready? And he said, yeah. Um, what are you giving up? And he's like, ah. I mean, we kind of, not not a, in a braggadocious way, but we, we really both try to embrace, as you and I have talked mm. about, Exodus 365. Yeah, like, yeah, you're right, yeah. The, the, this time of year, there's going to be some little things that may change just to, you know, more deep in our mortifications or adding some extra times of intentional prayer. But, right. Um, but this great joy of, of living our life for God, um, constantly being conscientious and, and more mindful of how we are f- following Him. Yeah. You know, it does. It's just fun because I was telling him it's it's nice because it seems like everybody else is kind of on the same page for a while, which yeah. is really it's yeah. exciting to see the the young kids in your parish getting excited. You know, I I teach a lot of uh, formation and young kids telling me, Father, I'm going to be giving up this or that for you know they're excited, they're genuinely excited, and even if it's something yeah silly. Um, in my mind, in their mind, it's huge. And right. the fact that there's a desire to give it up and they actually can even articulate and kind of name, yeah, I'm doing this because I love Jesus and I, I want to get closer to him. And I'm, okay, awesome. So, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have some fun this afternoon talking about uh, all these themes. But uh, we're going to kind of go right into this, this big question of, you know, so there's guidelines. You know, the, the, the liturgy is not the product of, of my feelings on a Sunday morning. Thanks mm-hmm. be to God, right? You know, and we've <laughs> talked about that before, and we'll open that up a little bit more. But, you know, the, the priest doesn't have the right to impose his will on the people of God when it comes to the sacred liturgy. The right. sacred liturgy is given to us by God through the church and the authority of the church. And so we have, um, you know, books that teach us and tell us what we're supposed to be doing. And, uh, you know, famously, it's do the red, say the black. Um, it keeps you out of trouble because you're doing exactly what the church tells you to do. But but behind even the missile um, that we use in our daily daily mass um, is the the general instructions of the Roman Missal and, and that and some other legislative texts that the, the, the Vatican have published over the years help to guide and give us a, an insight into the themes of the seasons that we're celebrating. And um, this special character of, of Lent is for me, emphasized in two ways. One is silence, mm. and the other one is a deprivation of, you know, joy, but not to the point of extinguishing the joy, but in a way more faithfully building up the reason for the joy. Mm. So, you know, I'll get, we'll get into practical examples in a little bit, but I, I'll take that and then I want to kind of turn it to you and ask you what the season of Lent through the Mass kind of helps you better understand. But silence first is, you know, in the general instructions of the Roman Missal, I think it's number 56, it, it talks about the need for silence um, to promote meditation. And uh, very often, Doug, you know this, if you go, you, I mean, daily Masses, it's even more obvious sometimes, but Sunday Masses, there's no quiet. Mm. It's like the reader yeah. gets done and says the the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And that psalm is rocking and rolling yeah. immediately. And then the psalm's done, and then second reader's already pounding into it. And then as soon as the second reader finishes, you know, their last breath, the Alleluia is already going. And so there's just th- this r- no time to meditate on the word yeah. of God. And the beauty of the Lenten liturgy is that it demands. Hmm. That meditation. Yeah. Um, it does that in a couple ways. It wanted. It says there's to be no instrumental music that does not accompany the voice. Mm. So you're not going to have musical interludes. You're not going to have a huge build up to a, an Alleluia acclamation or mm. even the Psalm itself. Really, 
ideally is just chanted a cappella yeah. um, because it permits more of the silence to resonate around the word. Um, and so that's that's one of the things that I think really continues to speak to me as a priest is helping you, helping the faithful to better appreciate the power of silence, right, right within the liturgy itself. Um, and then talking a little bit about that that suspended joy. So we, so we don't do the Alleluia, we don't do the Gloria, the the settings of the Mass themselves, the um, the Canon. Uh, I'm sorry, the Eucharistic prayer um, with the prefaces proper to the season. Mm. Talk about fasting, mortification, almsgiving, um, and prayer. You know, it kind of just keeps pounding those themes into our head. Um, in light of the hope of the resurrection, right? right. And so instead of having a, a maybe a, an artificial joy, which sometimes I think we, we are all guilty of, we kind of just put the, we fake it till we make it, right? Yeah, we right. smile <laughs> so that people will leave us alone. Yeah. <laughs> um, what the ch- church's liturgy is kind of calling us into is, okay, we've got to really actually meditate on the fact that Christ died for our sins, and we are called to imitate him, to take up our cross, to endure our sufferings and follow him. And the liturgy is providing that literally in the Word of God, like reading through Isaiah and reading mm-hmm. the Suffering Servant, um, and then in the Gospels, just kind of seeing the build up to the great, you know, it, the, the great days of the Passion. Um, that we constantly are kind of encountering that need to let go of the illusion of joy we have in things of the world, yeah. and really focus on the joy we actually have and the hope that comes from the Gospel. Yeah. Um, so. I've blabbered for a little bit. I just want to kind of turn to you for a little bit. And, um, yeah, just kind of put that question to you. You know, how has the season of Lent as a man, as a father, as a husband, um, in the Mass itself, how has it kind of helped shape your discipleship? What are you? What are themes that you see that kind of shape? Well, the one, on? the one thing, you, the first thing you brought up about silence is, is uh, I mean, that's uh, that's gotten, that has become more and more important to me, as it should for all of us. You know, we're, we live in a world where we're inundated with noise and distraction. And it has crept into the mass to where, you're right. One thing just follows the other, and there's no peace. And when I, I, I see places all over the country when I travel, you know, for conferences or rallies or wherever I am, I'm at, where very seldom do you have, even at the time of Holy Communion, um, much time at all after communion is over mm. for us just to sit. We've just received Jesus. I mean. Right, he's physically still in us mm-hmm. until that what fifteen to twenty minutes or so that the for the for the natural aspects of the host to break down the accents of the host, but in that time period, what a moment just to have that time of silence. But instead, we're looking at the watches, we're wanting to check our phone. Right? We're so caught up in these things that when Lent comes along and when it's done right, mm-hmm. and you know what I mean by that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Some places it isn't done right. If we're following what the church has wanted us to do and what our Lord really is reaching out for us to do is is to choose to set those things aside and have the time of silence. And hopefully that becomes 365 then, mm-hmm. our whole life, where we set time aside every day for the silence to be with God. You know, the famous you know passage in the Old Testament of Elijah going off into the cave to search for God, trying to find God, hear God. It wasn't in the earthquake. It wasn't in the storms and the winds and all this. It was in the, it was in the whisper. Mm-hmm. And and you can't hear a whisper unless there's silence. If there's too much noise going on, you're not going to hear the guy whispering across the room. You can be standing right next to somebody whispering, but even within a couple of feet, if there's all kinds of noise and they're choosing to be distracted by the things around them, they don't hear the whisper. And if God's really truly trying to ri- whisper to our hearts, really down deep inside the core of who we are as men and women of all ages, then we have to choose this. That's one of the things I really like about Lent and the way the liturgy is celebrated at this time, when you do remove certain aspects to allow, as you said, Father, time for silence, for deeper reflection, we're built for this. Mm. You know, one of the things that really struck me years ago, I read a book, I was challenged to read this book, Fire Within by Father Thomas Dubé. Great book, yeah. Oh, my goodness. On the contemplative life of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa of Avila, who were good friends, both mystics, both saints, both doctors of the church. Wow. Imagine hanging out with the right people, you know. Right. And uh, they both uh, they both speak so powerfully of the fact that contemplative life is not just for religious. Everybody has an aspect of them that has to have that contemplative side, and Lent gives us an opportunity for that. I just encourage anybody listening or watching right now to really look at the day 
And those of us who are lay people, I mean, it's easy for us to be so distracted with kids and extracurricular activities, and, and anybody can do this, but as, as a lay people, we, well, you know, it's, uh, it's different for me than you, Father. You have to have your hour of adoration. Mm-hmm. You have to pray the, the hours, and, and you have to have your, you know, your readings. Every, yeah, but you know what? I've got other things to take care of. It's like, are you kidding me? There's nothing more important. No. I need to, I need to, I need to take time every day to talk to my wife. Mm-hmm. I need to take time every day to set everything aside just to make sure that she knows whether it's a phone call or whether if I'm out of town or something or whether, you know, if I'm home, we need to make time every day to be in the presence of each other at the dinner table, in the living room, sitting in the same room, both reading, both praying, maybe praying together, praying apart from each other, but we're, we're there. Right. And we make the time. We don't just have to, we don't just fall into it. We make the time for it. So Lent to me, opportunity, the liturgy, the way it's celebrated during Lent, great time for us to just really look at Am I allowing the distractions to consume me? Am I consuming these things so much that they're consuming me now? Or am I setting those things aside and letting the silence, these moments of peace and reflection, allow me to go deeper? Am I choosing to go deeper? Because if I don't, I'm missing out. And then that joy part you mentioned, just real quick on that, comes to mind is, you're right, superficial joy. Hey, how's it going? Hey, everything's really good. Inside, where's my heart, though? Mm. Is my heart really... In, in this moment of joy. And the true the truest joy is when you're with the one that you love the most. Even when they're suffering and they're in pain, you're with them because you know there's something about this relationship that must be must be embraced and must be nurtured and cared for. Yeah, and I'm so thankful to God. Like it, it's been a, a whirl whirlwind of sorts at times trying to figure out how do you how do you explain to you know the six-year-olds, and then you're talking to the at the school, and then you're talking to the eighth graders, and then you're talking to the college kids, and you know, it's breaking it down as simply as possible. I think that's the beauty of the church. It, mm. The church's teaching is that she really is just trying to emphasize very simply through the instructions she gives us for this season is to really focus on that silence, mm. to focus on not being distracted by sights and sounds and smells and bells and all the things that, right. that do make the liturgy in so many ways very beautiful, but kind of stripping it down to its essence and what it's supposed to do is to bring us into an encounter with with the living God, to hear the whispering voice yeah. in the stillness of our hearts. And so... Um, I think encounter is a great word to think <clears throat> about. Yeah. Deepen that, that encounter with the living God. Yeah, and I so where are we going to go to encounter the living God. So we, we have the gift of the Eucharist. We have our, our Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity that's a prisoner in the tabernacle <laughs> and waiting for us to come visit him. Yeah. Um, but even in our homes, we kind of have to, we, we look at how the liturgy affects us in the proper prayer of it, but then we take from the liturgy, we take from the gift of the Eucharist into our homes. And one of the things that I, I friends of mine have done this before, and, and I think it's genius, is they they do a little ceremony where they, they write out Alleluia on a piece of paper and on Ash Wednesday, um, they take, you know, with their kids, they go out and they bury that piece of paper. Hmm. Um, don't dig a deep hole or anything, and, and, but they bury that piece of paper. They give a little catechesis to their children about what they're doing, why they're doing it. Um, and then on Easter Sunday morning, um, they go back and they dig up that piece of paper. And, hmm. you know, it's covered in dirt and it's kind of faded or whatever, but... What a way of reinforcing the joy yeah. of of Easter, yeah. uh, but also recognizing in a, in a physical way, and we need this as humans, we need physical things to remind us, like, yeah, we're going to enter into this season of, of penance. We're going to enter into this time in which we're not singing the joy of Hallelujah because we are anticipating the joy of the Alleluia. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of practical things that, that roll out from what the liturgy is telling us to do. Um, so I talked about a little bit about the general instructions of the Roman Missal, or, or for short, it's the GERM. Mm. Uh, it's one of my favorite acronyms because <laughs> uh, we could just say it's germy, you know, in seminary. But uh, kind of looking at the famous maxim, Lex Arandi, Lex Credendi, how we pray is how we believe. Um, and the shape of the liturgy in this season takes on some some other particular notes that I'm going to kind of talk about, and then I want to kind of just get your reaction, really, just in, in turn. And these are things that I know you, eat at least at some level, of recognized, but mm-hmm. maybe it's not been point, pointed to you. And I, I, that's one of the things we're trying to do is teach people how to how to talk about this. So, sure. first one I'm thinking of is no flowers, no flowers during Lent. That's in the general instructions of the Roman Missal, with <laughs> the exception of solemnities and the fourth Sunday of 
uh, Lent, which is called Laetare Sunday. It's during uh, Advent. It's the second Sunday is Gaudete, uh, or third Sunday, I'm sorry, is Gaudete Sunday. But the church specifically says there's to be no flowers during the season of Lent to adorn the altar, to adorn the sanctuary. And I'll be honest with you, I mean, as a young dude, I, I could care less. Like, <laughs> like, I, you know, as a 10-year-old boy, I don't even know that there's flowers up there, honestly, right? Yeah. And you probably didn't notice I either. I didn't pay that much attention to it. <laughs> right, right, right. And then as you get older, and maybe for you is because, oh, i got to buy flowers for my wife. For me, it was just, oh, why? man, there's a lot of roses up yeah. there. You know, Easter and Christmas, you kind of get hit yeah. in the face with all the flowers. But the rest of the year, you're kind of like, okay, don't even notice it. But, but it became very stark to me, I remember, mm-hmm. in seminary. Man. There's there's a lack of of liveliness mm. um, that the fact that we use real flowers, not fake fake mm-hmm. flowers, for example, but just the fact that there's there's not that living beauty around the altar. There there's there's something missing there. Yeah. Um, it 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 struck me. I was like, oh well, this is. I'm thinking about that maybe the first time I encounter it, but I'm also thinking about okay, why would the church say to take these mm. things away? Um, and so you read a little bit about the history, and I, I, I did that in my spare time. And to a great degree, it, it's, again, it's a, an opportunity to silence the noise of our senses. Yeah. You know, to instead of having my eyes averted towards the flowers, my eyes are focused much more solely on the altar itself, you know, the altar in which Christ's death on the cross is made present to us in an unbloody manner, as the right. Catechism says. But also that my eyes are, in a sense, more supernaturally oriented towards the host, that the, the, the Lord's coming to me in the living bread that right. comes down from heaven. So taking up that theme of something living at the altar, well, the most alive thing at the altar is the consecrated host. You know, right. It's God incarnate amongst us. And that was just a, a big eye-opener for me. But yeah, I'm, I'm asking you, and I'm kind of looking at you, I'm like, I don't know that you probably didn't. Maybe no. you didn't know. I didn't know that. Yeah. So there's no flowers. No, I, I was not aware that that was in the uh, that was in the instruction that that was supposed to be the case. And it makes sense. You know, as Jesus is stripped of his garments, we are to be stripped mm-hmm. of of the worldliness. We're supposed to make room for for God and in all ways, and even good things. And flowers are good. Right. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Right. But removing them and and stripping that away does allow us to focus. It's like in any room, like right now I'm staring at a shelf, a series of shelves with all kinds of equipment and everything on it. If you were to take everything off the shelf except one camera or one set of headphones, I'd only see that. Mm. And it, it allows you clearly to focus when you remove the other things, even though, even though the other things aren't bad. Right. So you're right. That, that's a really great, great point there is it allows us to see the most alive thing there at that moment is obviously our Lord. Right, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Praise be God. But yeah. there's a there's a, a, another sense of when the church asks us to do something like that. It 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 also requires an interior asceticism for the mm. priest because you know most people probably don't even know that instruction exists, right? And then on top of that, well, what if I just want a little bit of decoration? Is nobody you know? No, it's Father. It's clear. It says there is to be no floral decoration at hmm. the altar and, and to adorn the sanctuary. So it takes that option and says no. So I have to die to myself a little bit if I think, oh, it would be really nice if you know, because out here in East Texas, for example, azaleas come into bloom basically during the Lenten season, kind of right around Easter. So it is cool that <laughs> at Easter we get these beautiful big azaleas. But even before then, they're starting to bloom. It'd be really nice to put some azaleas around the. But no, yeah. the Lord's calling all of us through the liturgy to adore Him, to not adore the azaleas, yeah. to not adore the roses, to, and to to take away from the obsession of the physical elements of the liturgy and focus on the spiritual elements yeah. of the liturgy. So that's that's one example. Um, another example in the general instructions that, again, I don't know that a lot of people um, notice this, but and I mentioned it earlier, but there's only to be instrumental music that complements vocal music. Um, so in other words, there are no interludes, there's no music that's supposed to be playing unless somebody's singing. Hmm. Um, and this can become a challenge in some places oh, yeah. because people are so used to that noise. They're yeah. so used to communion being consumed, even if they 
only sing one song, well, the organist or the piano player continues to play until sure. communion's done, and Father's sat down in his seat, and the church is saying explicitly, like, you can you can sing the entire time, but you have to be singing. You can't mm-hmm. just be playing music. And so what we see adopted a lot of times in parishes is a, a more simple approach during the season of Lent, maybe to do more a cappella sometimes to do the Latin parts, which is is nice. Uh, yeah. you know, we, we shouldn't associate Latin with penance, by the way. Uh, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's a <laughs> no, good thing. It's, it's a great thing. But, but the idea of, okay, what's the church, again, trying to say with, with this depriving us of some of the sensory enjoyment mm-hmm. of the liturgy? Well, again, it's just saying you need to focus on God. Yeah, go you deeper. Go deeper. Let that living tabernacle that you are after communion be adored let christ be adored in you with your whole mind your whole body your whole whole soul like to not be distracted about which page in the mislet you need to flip to to sing along with the yeah. song but to rather let this silence settle in um so just curious for you you know how how do you you know, maybe in the midst of the distraction of music, but even more so knowing that, you know, that you go into the Lent with the desire to go deeper. How do you kind of take that time of Thanksgiving after receiving communion? Like, what what's that process look like? Because I think it would be helpful for people who are going to experience this silence. Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh, now I've got maybe two to seven minutes of silence while communion is being distributed. What do I do? Yeah. I, for me, I mean, you know, the word solemn comes to mind. It's a solemn moment. It's it's a it's a it's a reflection. Um, uh, you know, on a natural level, I think a lot of people get kind of antsy. You know, we get antsy <laughs> if I'm not doing something. And a lot of people got that 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 knee shake thing mm-hmm. going. You see people sitting there and they're just restless legs and restless legs and I guess yeah, I call it that, but they're just they're ready to they're ready to go. I'm at mass and I'm ready to move on. Mhm. You have to take deep breath. Like for me, we, we start slowing down like that. I just have to just breathe in, take a deep breath, let it out, relax, and know. Just know. It has to, be a, to me, it has to be an, an actual decision, choice you're making inside. I know I'm here. I know what this, I'm supposed to know what this is about, what's going on here. I know I've just received Jesus. Although that leads to the problem of people not believing Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, and then they don't know that they've really received Jesus. Right. That's another podcast. I think we did something on that once. We did once. Yeah. We'll go back to it. But, for sure. you know, the fact that this is Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. This isn't a new Jesus. It is in a different moment. If this is this is Calvary has come to us again. We've stepped on a Calvary again here. Yeah. The curtain has been pulled back at the moment of consecration. We're at Calvary. We've received Jesus. Take a deep breath right. and choose to just relax. And just let this, especially during this time, and then hopefully it carries over into the rest of the year where we take these moments just to relax. So for me, physically, mentally, emotionally, I have to just take a deep breath, relax, and thank God that I have these few moments. Mm -hmm. I wish they were more. I wish they were longer now. When I was younger, yeah, I'm restless. I want to go because I'm an intense guy. I got energy. I'm ready to go. But boy, at a time like this when I have to sit back and relax, take that deep breath and just, just accept. I've just received Jesus. This is the moment I'm going to take this in. We don't have these moments very much in our life, Father. You know that. No. And, and I just encourage the listeners out there, those watching, look, we don't have these moments. When we stand before God, we will wish we had taken this time at these moments that we have just received Jesus in communion and really breathe that in. We stand before God, we're not going to be thinking about, oh, I didn't, I didn't close another business deal. You know, I didn't get to that sporting event. Oh, I didn't play another tournament. Oh, I, I missed out on this, 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 of this world. We're gonna, we're gonna think, oh wow, I should have, I should have taken those moments to prepare for this moment, mm. the most important day of my life, the day I die and stand before God. Mm. I don't want to take that for granted. But having that opportunity to receive communion, receive our Lord Holy Communion, and then those few moments afterwards to take that deep breath and breathe that in, is my is my encounter, my connection with heaven at that moment. Yeah. Ah, just I don't want to miss that. Heaven meets earth. That's yeah. the, that's the glory of the of the liturgy and the glory of God made manifest to us and Take a deep breath, relax people. Yeah. yeah. Breathe it in. Yeah, as a, and as a you know, as a priest it, it 
it's the busiest time of mass in a sense, you know, mm. to distribute communion, to come back to the altar, to um, purify the sacred vessels, to do that reverently and well, yeah. not in a hasty fashion, but kind of having that sense that, okay, people are waiting, you know, they're waiting mm. for me to get done. Um, I was very impressed, and I it's total shout out to our bishop, but about a year and a half ago, he really, he, he and I were talking, and he said, he just said, I, I'm going to start really having an intentional pregnant pause after communion. Hmm. Um, and I said, okay, awesome. We have to like, thumbs up, Bishop. That's a great idea. I think it's desperately needed. Um, you will probably run into some people that are going to be upset or probably, you know, <laughs> are going to be like, hey, what's with all the silence? And, and, and to his credit, you know, a, a year and a half later, I know it's Sunday Masses. That's still what he's doing. He <laughs> visits every parish, and it's it's awkward if you're not used to it. I think, God willing, the people at the cathedral at least are used to it. But yeah. but just the reality is is that he is leading by that example. And so, as a priest, when I get done with the purification of the vessels and I go back to the the chair and sit for a little bit, um, I'm obviously trying to be conscientious of yeah. my Lord and my God. And I, I want to say I love it when a priest does that. I really appreciate it. he's sitting down. Everything has stopped now. All the vessels are purified. Everything has stopped. Done. Music stopped. And I, I sometimes, because you're used to them, just the priest just right. a lot of times. Jump back up. Okay. Let us go. pray. Let us pray. But, boy, when I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, he's taking some time. Oh, man, now I can, I can, take, that, I can take another breath. I can, mm. I can breathe a little bit more now this moment in. And you know what? I had to come to that. I had to come to accept that. Again, I know there are people out there. They're busy. They're doers. And they think that's the way to go. You know, we just got to go all the time. And I said, yeah, no, 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 no. Except if Father has taken that moment to sit there and, and, and breathe this in, do the same thing. Because I, I just want to acknowledge you, Father. I thank you for doing that. And I thank priests who do do that. And I encourage other priests, don't worry about what the crowd's thinking and feeling. We need this. We're built for, for this moment right. of silence and reflection, just like we're built for, you know, 75% more made up of water and all this, you know what I mean? And we need water, be right. hydrated. Well, we need silence and peace. And sometimes sometimes it's got to be kind of imposed on us right. gently, and it's only for a few minutes, for heaven's sake. Right. It's really not that long. And technically it is for heaven's sake. So. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> I like that. <laughs> like that. I remember in the seminary during Lent, we would uh, we would eat, I think— two nights a week, maybe three nights a week in silence. Mm. And wow. they would read, um, not the whole time, but they would read for maybe like the last 10 minutes from either the rule of St. Benedict or from some writings of some saints. And what a what an instruction that was. And again, it stems out of the liturgy. And I know mon- the monastics do this year round mm. all the time, but, yeah. but just even in a diocesan setting, in a, di- in a seminary, um, to take that time at what is normally a very conversational time to, to have a meal um, and to place it in the, in the presence of God. And so how that, again, carries out, and I'm thinking about our pra- our listeners, practical practicalities, fo- Father, what, do you, what can we do? Mm-hmm. One recommendation would be just maybe at least one meal a week at home um, that instead of, you know, going through a long conversation with you and your spouse or with you and your kids, um, to have, have that time, but then... At the end of the meal, instead of jumping up and going back to you know recording podcast or uh, you know whatever you got <laughs> fi- answering five hundred emails and, right. and your wife's going to go you know take care of seventeen hundred things like let's take an extra ten minutes and maybe either listen to a, a, a reflection on the readings or to read together the mm. gospel for the coming Sunday yes you know at least building that in to where once a week you're you're again, reigniting, making a spiritual communion in that time mm. with our Lord in the Eucharist, because the, the, that's that's what the Church is desiring for us, is that we come back to the source and summit of our joy. Yeah. Um, and so that's something you can do at home relatively easily. So I sure. um, want to talk about one other kind of aspect of, of the Lenten liturgical life, and then we're going to get into the final uh, points on this uh, podcast, but it's the covering of statues. Mm, you know, yeah. Um, as the boy from the South that I am, uh, this really always threw me off as a kid. And, <laughs> and it's sure, I'm sh- I know I asked my priests, hey, why do we do that? And, you know, I had an Irish priest my first 15 years, and I had a, an, an 
uh, a native Texan the next 15 years, and they probably told me exactly what I've been reading, but I don't remember. Um, <laughs> and I kind of feel like I'm like most Catholics out there, like, oh, statues are covered. Something's happening. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so the instructions, something's going on yeah, here. something's going on here, but the instructions are, are pretty clear in the general instructions of the Roman Missal again, um, in the season of Lent that you can, starting with the fifth Sunday of Lent, um, cover all the statues. Um, and it's not rocket science. Why are we covering the statues? Mm-hmm. To again, kind of focus us interiorly and through our senses on our Lord right. alone right. Um, to kind of these are goods as we're talking about it's not that any of these things are bad but these things can become a source of distraction so it's a really intense thing I can say from the priest's perspective to cover all the statues in a church like mm-hmm. it takes time I, I'm hey I'll be the first to tell you I don't do it by myself I do it with a team of people and <laughs> depending on the size of the church you, you could be talking I think of St. John Cantius in Chicago there's probably 300 statues in that place right like it's it's insane or think about St. Peter's yeah. can you imagine um, but all of that's done so that we can focus on God yeah. present and the Eucharist. And I, I can't help but think about the church's, you know, admonition there. What are we trying to do? We're not trying to take away from the saints, not trying, trying to take away from the Blessed Virgin Mary and her great intercession for all of us. But what we're trying to do is, again, lead us back to that gospel that you were talking about mm-hmm. that we'll hear this coming Sunday is our Lord was led into the desert mm-hmm. for 40 days and 40 nights and fasted and prayed so that he could live for his father, so that he could show us what it means to live out of love for the father. And so we're kind of getting the chance to do that again in, in, a, in a much easier way. Like yeah. we're not in a desert. No, this is not. I'm, a, I'm in an air rough. conditioned church. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the statues are covered. Oh, well. Um, cushion pews normally. Cushion, exactly. Cushion kneelers. Right, exactly. So, um, so in that little way, our senses are being deprived, and yeah. we're having to kind of endure a suffering. We don't get to see the beautiful images that normally adorn our churches. Yeah. But um, I, I think that's such a, a powerful thing, right? You know, and, and I'm wondering for you because you did grow up in the Midwest, where this Catholic culture is more obvious, and you couldn't find a church that that you know didn't have st- statues covered and mm-hmm. images covered. So, well, how that struck you? And, yeah, and I mean, for me, I mean. Uh, I, I didn't see it when I was younger so much as this is the church's way of trying to help me focus on on Christ more. Um, what what I took from it, and no one really actually explained it to me. Like like right. just, okay, the church is doing this for the purpose of really trying to funnel all of our attention, focus, interior, exteriorly to Christ. But I took it as man, I miss him. Mm. So I loved it on. On uh, you know Easter Sunday, or if you go to the vigil on Saturday right. night, and the bells are ringing, and right. all the all the cloth comes off the statues. Mm-hmm. Oh, that that was exciting! Mm-hmm. It's like, well, they're back. Hey, right. hey it's guys, like, just go back into the room. Hey, right. how's it going? We're hanging out. We're together again. Yeah, you know, it's a very simple way of putting it, but it is a deep appreciation. What I would help, what it helped me do is appreciate the family aspect mm-hmm. of the saints, and also the visual aspect of who we are, our humanity, that we visually, we see things and we connect when we see. Right. So, you know, and this could be a point of, you know, apologetics for those who claim, you know, you worship Mary, you worship statues, and this So, no, these images help us connect with who this is an image of. Right. And that is, that's very, very important, very deeply important that we understand that we are a family and you know the whole the, the church broke into the three parts church triumph and church suffering church militant so forth. Right. we're the church militant we're still in the thick of the battle church suffering poor souls and holy souls in purgatory and the church trumpet those in heaven and when you cover up those souls that are in heaven the church triumphant, the saints you miss them they're, yeah because they're part of your family right right so go home and cover your picture of grandma and your mom your dad your children your loved ones and just leave it that way for a few weeks and then realize, wow, something's missing. And then when you uncover it, it's, oh, yeah, the relationship. So to me, that was a major part for me was mm-hmm. to help me appreciate the family aspect of who these saints are and what they have done. And then when you go deeper in understanding the saints, then you realize 
they were focused on Christ. Right. So they're there to help remind me to, to point. point to Jesus. Yep. And that's yeah. what they do. And that's uh, that's uh, really that's so beautiful, man. I, I'm so glad you brought that up because I I certainly have never thought about it that way. I, I've I've begun to think more about what the church's specific instruction talks about. So on Good Friday, it says you can uncover images mm. of the crucified Lord. Right. Which for veneration purposes. For ven- yeah. purposes of veneration, yeah. which makes sense. Yeah. And then on Holy Saturday, um, in anticipation, of, so sometime before the vigil mass that mm. you can uncover, or in some places where you got a, a really with it priest who can coordinate those pieces, like the lights come on at the glory of the statues are yeah. unveiled, the yeah. bells are ringing. Like that's a super ah, that is awesome. liturgical moment to, yeah. to really let the beauty of all of our senses be engaged fully in what's happening. And when you think about it, it this is that's the only moment in the history, or, or, excuse me, in the entire year that happens. It is, yeah. At one moment right there on Saturday at the vigil, boom. It's what the whole church's year builds towards yeah. and you know, pr- proceeds from. It's, yeah. it, so we call it colloquially, it's the Super Bowl of, of, of the year for us as, as priests. Like, it's a real tough couple of quarters getting there, <laughs> but the joy of, you know, the Easter vigil, the joy of welcoming, you know, God willing catechumens into the church, but sure. the whole life of the liturgy comes so fully alive that evening with the fire and everything. So and we're going to actually do an episode on Holy Week itself mm. later on, so we'll be getting more into those details. But uh, I want to move into just kind of the third part of this and then into the chariot. Um, we've been talking a lot about how the liturgy forms us and informs us. And again, general instructions of the Roman Missal, anybody can read those. They're online for free. Go to Google, put in general instructions of the Roman Missal. You'll come up on our Vatican.va. It's there. It's in English. It's in Spanish. It's in Portuguese and French, et cetera. So <laughs> you, you got every effort, every opportunity to read it. But it, it speaks more to one of the, the great mysteries that I think you and I have experienced in different ways, age, circumstances, cultures, et cetera. But how the liturgy itself really shapes us as disciples. Um, you know, for a, a priest or a religious, we are we are obliged, as you mentioned, we are obliged to pray the liturgy of the hours. But more than an obligation, it's an opportunity. And it, and it at times, sometimes, rarely for me, has it been difficult. But more often than not, I find it more and more is it's changing little habits in my daily life. It's changing habits in the way I I talk to God. It's changing the ways in which I even experience or understand how God's talking to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Liturgy of the Hours, as was encouraged by the Second Vatican Council explicitly and has been consistently since then, is something you can bring into the home. It's something that nobody is not able to pray, right? But it's mm-hmm. something that's hard to pick up because it's it, it requires page turning, and we've got apps now that literally tell you how to do it so yeah. it's pr- it's pretty convenient but no excuses uh, really no excuses but the, the just living liturgically itself right. so we're letting the shape of the next you know six weeks essentially of lent shape the way you and i are going to choose to live intentionally every day of our life and that's something that doesn't need to be limited to lent mm. and, and i'm afraid too often that is one of the sh- one of the, the challenges is kind of we we get this retreat high right from lent like a lot more people go to daily mass that's just a statistic fact Mm -hmm. you'll see that more people go to confessions during this time of year you'll see generally speaking sunday attendance actually goes up pretty consistently throughout the season of lent ash wednesday being of course the most attended day of mass of the entire year Mm -hmm. um despite it not being a holy day of obligation (laughs) um but but we'll see that that increase but then there's the easter high and then And it's like, Mm. no, we've got a whole octave just right there at the beginning of Easter. We've got like eight Sundays in a row, folks. We've got eight days of eating meat and drinking scotch and whatever you're going to do, you know, to enjoy (laughs) yourself because these are the feasts of feasts. And then, yeah, we kind of trickle into the Acts of the Apostles for the next 43 days until um, the Ascension, and it it gets real challenging. So I want to ask you just kind of at a practical level, how have you – seen the liturgy shape more of your daily life and your discipleship as as a son of God and as a follower of Christ and then maybe some recommendations to those you know in your state of life who are married who are people you know mm-hmm. who's a man who works and you know has to kind of be in multiple places maybe in even a given week if there's mm-hmm. ways in which you've seen the liturgy help to shape the way you live 
Oh, on a number of levels. One, um, the first and most important aspect is the fact that there's there's a, the supernatural grace that comes from that moment. You know, receiving our Lord in Holy Communion, coming to assist in in this holy sacrifice of the Mass. There's grace received if we're in the state of grace, mm-hmm. state of sanctifying grace. We receive, in, I mean, it's uncounted, un, an unknown number of graces. We have to remember that. So on a, nat- I mean, a supernatural level, that that just has to be a known fact that, that drives us. Mm. On a natural level, the discipline of knowing, you know, I need this. I need the discipline. We need discipline. We need order. You don't have peace if you don't have order. St. Augustine talks about this. From order, you get peace. From disorder, you get chaos. That's a simple version, but it makes a point. If things are out of order... You got chaos, and so mm-hmm. many families are out of order. You want to get your family back in order, get in order with God first. Augustine makes it clear. When you follow the order of God, you're going to find peace. Even in the midst of trials and, and crosses and sufferings and, and things that, whoa, catch you out of the blue, get laid off of work, a death of a loved one, a sickness, whatever, there will be peace in the, th- in the thick of that, even in the suffering, if we're in the order of God mm-hmm. by being in the state of grace and following what, what what the church teaches, getting to mass appropriate times and so forth, you know, a commandment, a third commandment to mass on, on mm-hmm. Sundays and so forth, and precept of the church. Now, all of that being said, beyond that, the readings and the homilies. And face it, we know not every homily is is a barn burner, you know, right, home right, run. Right. But you can find something. Mm-hmm. You can find some word in there, some some sentence, some point that Father's trying to make that you can walk out of that. That mass with, and it can it can change your day. Mm-hmm. And so for me, I look for those things. I, I look for that. I'm gonna try to find something positive. It's too easy to go to mass and complain. Father Somley is boring. Father Somley right. was this. Like, get off of that that bus. That's just gonna right. drive you right off a cliff. That is not how to live your life. We live our life looking for the positive, trying to find the light and the good where we can. Right. All right. And so I I go to mass and I'm I'm looking for those elements. I, the grace, of course, the discipline is important. Um, the, the chance to be at peace with God for a few moments there and just take that in and know this, if I were to die here of a heart attack, this is the place to go. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the presence of our Lord. But then to find those day-to-day things, how does it change my day? How does it change my week? I take those nuggets, those, those statements that come in the homily or that one, something from that one reading, and I, I want to apply that. Mm-hmm. But this is choice. You know, Father, I have to tell myself, and I would tell everybody out there listening, look, you choose this or you choose not. You choose to do it or you choose not to do it. Right. But this isn't something where you go to Mass and you expect to receive all this by osmosis. Look, I'm in the building, therefore I'm <laughs> going to get this and walk out, and I didn't have to do anything for it. That's like going to the weight room and thinking you're going you're gonna to get stronger and healthier because you just walked in right. and, you, and you touched the bar. Ooh, 45-pound bar. Took a towel. I, and then I toweled off a little bit, no sweat, but, you know, I'm still going to grow from this, right? No, you're not. So going to Mass, walking into the church and being present and then walking out and choosing to take with you the natural aspects of the readings and, and the homilies and so forth in that moment, and then in embracing and trying to live by the grace that you could have received at that moment, it, it's a choice. That's how I see it. Yeah. It's a choice. Is it going to change my day and my week? If I let it. Right. If I choose to embrace it, if I choose to own it. Otherwise... I'm just clocking in and clocking out. You know, you right. put your hand in the holy water font, and you walk in and match your clock in, you walk out after match your clock out, holy water font, and that's where a lot of people are. That's where I was for years. Sure. Until I chose to embrace it and make it my own. Right. Well, we've got a beautiful opportunity, I think, coming up with, with this season of Lent, and uh, we want to just encourage all of our listeners and viewers to to really be considering how silence is going to be integrated into your your Lent. Uh, obviously, the, the recommendations are there for the liturgy itself, but also what are you doing at home? How are you embracing more mm-hmm. silence at home? How are you living joy in an authentic way? Um, where is that joy, source of joy? Is joy coming? You know, I, I've, I've got nephews and nieces and grandnephews, and, and uh, one of our coworkers here just had a, a sweet little baby boy, and you know I find a, a sincere and deep joy in children mm-hmm. and, and holding a baby, and you know listening to my nephews and nieces talk about what's going on in their life, and and that's that's an authentic joy that comes from you know sharing in the communion with one another through the gift of the church and through Christ, but but being conscientious too that even though these are goods and th- these are joys that I mm-hmm. sincerely desire and want to have, uh, that, that my greatest joy 
comes from our Lord that we need to continue to, to cultivate that through yeah. our through our Lenten uh, disciplines. But can I, can I go ahead? Comment please? real quick, yeah. Father, on, on that point about what we take to our homes. Um, take this opportunity. I encourage everybody. You know, and this is what I've tried to do over the years. My wife and I is, um, you know, get rid of cable, get rid of your satellite, you know, or, or cut way back on it. Shut mm-hmm. the TV off. Get a cabinet. The, the, my TV cabinet at home is not an entertainment center. We have entertainment centers because entertainment becomes the center of our life. Mm-hmm. I have a cabinet with doors on it, and if I'm not watching the TV, the doors are closed. I want Great. it out of sight, out of mind. Right. It's been that way for years. I don't want that TV to be a central part of my life. I don't want entertainment. I don't want worldliness in general. I want, as you just described, the little baby, the children, the time with your loved ones, your spouse, and so forth. You know, make time happen that way in your mm-hmm. home. And I'm, I'm telling you out there, everybody listening, watching, this is a choice. You don't just walk in the house and say, okay, fix it, Lord. And then, boom, it happens. Angels come in, start rearranging furniture, you know, doing this and that. We wish. No, exactly. Right. Yeah, Give me that heavenly injection, Lord, then I'll feel like doing it. No, we have to choose. We know it's the best thing to do to pull back from the world mm-hmm. and, and, and engage more in the encounter with the living God personally and then through others as well. Mm-hmm. Our loved ones in particular, my wife, my children, my grandchildren are first and then everybody outside after that. But it starts in that home. But... I just encourage people, shut the TV off, shut the computer down a little more often. Right. You know, put the phones down with all the screens and the games right. and all this. Spend time, have meals together, look at one another. Play a little music in the background, a little ambiance music, that's mm-hmm. fine, you know. But let's communicate with one another. Look each other in the eyes, shake hands, hug, right. be together. Right. Uh, and then be intentional about if you are going to be doing something on a screen what's it actually for and, yeah. and is this benefiting me is this helping me to grow as a saint helping me as a businessman or you know whatever it may be but just not being wasteful that time and and which makes it more in- you're intending to do it for right. a particular purpose. it's a volitional choice R- correct once again and if there's a little recreation like i want to play a word you know a, a word puzzle or something mm-hmm. okay fine but don't let it dominate you right and don't let it override the more important uh, other people, in right. particular, and God. In your right. Life. I thought I, Pope Francis just the other day. I think this was on Sunday at his Angelus uh, was talking about you know all the fasting from chocolate and beer and whatever else. If it doesn't lead to love of neighbor, then it's in vain. And yeah. he's right on the yeah. head. He hits the point right sure, on the head. Absolutely. As he so often does. You know, he's got these zingers that come from a, a South American that you know any American bishop would probably be afraid to say. But he's just like there it is. <laughs> but it's true. Like. The fasting, the mortifying of our senses, the the intentional prayer, and the alms giving that is part of the tradition of our, our life during Lent, it is to lead to a fraternal charity. It is yeah. to have a, 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 an aspect of going to the other, and Lent in the home needs to be lived that way. We had a great mm-hmm. podcast episode last week with Mickey and Luke Arredondo on Lent in the home, um, and so I'd encourage people to go back and maybe watch that or listen to that if you haven't already. Um but taking what we're experiencing in the in the church and and kind of our, our spiritual home mm-hmm. and bringing it into our domestic homes and the domestic churches, um, you don't need to have uh, your stat you know all your images covered weeks five and six during Lent. It'd be cool if you you know yeah. if you wanted to cover like the images of Our Lady and Our Lord. Or the images of your grandma and your grandpa, whomever. But you know, in that sense, you can enter into that a little bit more. You can take the time to, uh, as I was talking about, maybe at dinner to be looking at the, the daily readings or the mm-hmm. Sunday readings to have that conversation with your kids, um, and and to be conscientious of how that leads to and you're wanting to do something more intentional for um, the poor or or to visit people in the nursing home or to right. make some act of intentional love towards towards your neighbor, but. We, we want the liturgy to continue to, to shape us throughout the year. And so we'll, we'll get to this during the Easter season, kind of looking at what's the, what's the distinctions um, and ha- how we, we celebrate during, the, during that time of the year. But what I, want, I kind of want to finish on, and then we'll go into the chariot, is just to pay attention, the easiest thing in the world to do, um, I think, in the midst of all this busyness that we are involved in, is to pay attention to the daily readings during the season of Lent. They are a roadmap for holiness. Um, you don't have to go to Mass to hear them, although I'd encourage that's the best place to hear them. Sure. Um, but there's apps, there's websites, et cetera, that will, will give you the daily readings. Um, but 
seeing the journey of the church through the eyes of the liturgy and seeing the journey of yourself as a, as a disciple um, following Christ through the sacred liturgy, really letting the readings drive that home for you. Um, so we're going to turn now just a couple minutes of basics of into the chariot, you know, how to quit, how to put what we've been talking about into practice. Um, and I first, I'm going to challenge the priest real quick. Um, I don't get to do that often enough, but uh, <laughs> one of my friends did. He's like, hey, that was a good recommendation. So here we go. Um, <laughs> guys, and maybe liturgical music ministry people too, if you're listening, use the antiphons for the masses during this time of year. Don't do the for him sandwich. Don't force people to sing unnecessarily long songs that are arduous and painful. Use the entrance antiphons. Use the the communion antiphon, the offertory. Like these are the words of scripture. They're not hard, and in fact, they're relatively easy to chant. Um, but that's also going to help you bring more silence into the into the sacred liturgy itself, because they, under themselves, are not supposed to last a long time. It's 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 a kind of a, a little maxim that comes out of the Psalms or it comes out of the New mm-hmm. Testament or Old Testament that just gives you a thematic idea of right. what the days, you know, or what that moment of the Mass is about. It complements the action of the liturgy. So I want to encourage my brother priests to really consider that and talk that over with their um, sacred musicians. And then more broadly, just for everybody, cool thing is, so Lent is 40 days. It's really it's like 48 days. Um, and then Easter's 50 days. So it's about 90 days. Well, guess what? Research shows it takes about 90 days to build a good habit, mm. right? We've got Exodus 90 going. We've got all yeah. these things going. So maybe here's an idea. Take the 90 days of Lent and Easter to develop one new consistent habit of mm. prayer. Nice. And we've talked about it before. There's no problem. We'll plug it again. I'd encourage the rosary. Amen. Maybe it's just a decade for 90 days to get in the habit of doing it daily. Yeah. But you've got 90 days to build up a good habit. And in the meantime, also, destroy some vice. Yeah, that's good. So that's rid, it for me. Get rid of the bad, bring in the good. Yep. I, I want to say this, too, especially to husbands and fathers out there. You, by, by the authority of God given to you as a husband and father, and claim that authority, you are the spiritual head of your family. Claim that authority. Be that spiritual leader, that spiritual head. Make sure you're letting the demons know by the way you live that you're on point and you are, you're fighting mm. that fight for your loved ones. Set the bar in your family. Set it a little higher during Lent, a little higher. And then, as you mentioned, Father, hopefully that becomes the habit and it just becomes the norm. Have the conversations with your kids. I've talked with my kids for years off and on. Sometimes it's a <laughs> subtle conversation. Sometimes it's a more sit down. We're going to talk for a half hour about something, we got, means, which means I have to know my stuff. I can't talk to my kids about something I don't know about. Mm. So I've got to study it, learn it myself, read it myself, understand it, what this saint said, what this pope wrote, what this church, what the church teaches here about this. I have to learn it. I have to study it. But then share it. Teach it to your kids and, and, and guide your wife in it as well. Maybe your wife knows more than you do on certain things because she's going to Bible study and she's reading Scripture more. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean you're not the spiritual authority of the home and of the family. So we need to take that back, that, that spiritual authority mm-hmm. we may have conceded you know, to the devils or, or to the world. We need to establish this home belongs to God. And when I die and stand before God, I will be asked how I led those in this home, Mm -hmm. how I ran this home. More so than our wives, men, we are going to be asked that. Wives, you are the battle partner. In fact, uh, in in the Greek, I think, uh, back in Genesis, when Eve is created, the the words are ezra konegdo. Mm -hmm. Ezra konegdo really means battle partner. Right. Battle buddy. We're in this together. All right, so my wife, my friend says, you know, my wife's my little sniper. So when I'm on the <laughs> battlefield, she's at the high ground picking off the demons from a distance with prayer and fasting yeah. for me. So ladies, you are just as much part of this, but the father, husband, you're the spiritual head. And ladies, you are the one that makes us men be the men we're called to be. You, you, mm-hmm. you affect us more than anything else on this planet. So ladies, build up your husbands and fathers to be that spiritual leader. Men, be that spiritual leader. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it so much as always, Doug. We enjoy, you know, getting to do this with ah, each other. It's great working with you, Father. Um, we want to encourage all of you who are listening or who are watching to uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and to iTunes. Uh, these are great venues in which you can experience the podcast and a lot of our other media productions here for the St. Philip Institute. 
And if you have questions uh, or future episodes you'd like to hear about, please send us an email at podcast at stphilipinstitute.org. We want to give thanks to God for this great season of Lent that's upon us and ask for our bishop's blessing. The Lord be with you, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.